We start today with venture capital legend Tom Perkins, who has set off a firestorm of controversy after he compared the, quote, war on the rich in America to the persecution of Jews in Nazi Germany. The co-founder of Kleiner Perkins Caulfield Byers will join me here in a moment, but first I want to read his full letter to the Wall Street Journal. He wrote, Writing from the epicenter of progressive thought, San Francisco, I would call attention to the parallels of fascist Nazi Germany to its war on its 1% namely its Jews, to the progressive war on the American 1%, namely the rich. From the Occupy movement to the demonization of the rich embedded in virtually every word of our local newspaper, the San Francisco Chronicle, I perceive a rising tide of hatred of the successful 1%. There is outraged public reaction to the Google buses carrying technology workers from the city to the peninsula high-tech companies which employ them. We have outrage over the rising real estate prices which these techno geeks can pay. We have, for example, libelous and cruel attacks in the Chronicle on our number one celebrity, the author, Danielle Steele, alleging that she is a snob despite the millions she has spent on our city's homeless and mentally ill over the past decades. This is a very dangerous drift in our American thinking. Kristallnacht was unthinkable in 1930. Is its descendant progressive radicalism unthinkable now? By Tom Perkins, founder of Kleiner Perkins Caulfield Byers. Joining me now here in the studio, Tom, do you regret this comparison? Um, yes. I, I talked to the head of the uh, uh, Anti-Defamation League uh, Abe uh, Foxman this morning, following up on a letter I had sent over the weekend, apologizing for the use of the word crystal knock. Uh, it was a, a terrible word to have chosen. Um, I, like many, have tried to understand the 20th century and uh, the incomprehensible evil of the Holocaust. It, it can't be explained even to try to explain it is questionable. It's wrong, it's evil. Now, I use the word because during the Occupy of San Francisco by the Occupy Wall Street crowd, uh, they broke the windows in the Wells Fargo Bank, they marched up to our automobile strip on Van Ness Avenue and broke all the windows in all the luxury car dealerships. And I saw that, I remember that the fleece just stood by frozen. And I thought, well, this is how Kristallnacht began. So that word was in my mind. But um, I did, uh, I don't necessarily need to read from this letter, but if you're interested, I, I can. Sure, go ahead. Uh, well, uh, I deeply apologize. This is a letter I wrote to the uh, Anti-Defamation League. I deeply apologize to you and any who have mistaken my reference to Kristallnacht as a sign of overt or latent anti-Semitism. This is not the case. My late partner, Eugene Kleiner, fled Hitler from Austria and fought in the U.S. Army. We became the deepest of friends during, during our long association, and he taught me, quote, never imagine that the unimaginable cannot become real. He was never comfortable with the extreme political currents in America and never took our freedom from demonization for granted. I believe that he would have understood my Wall Street Journal letter and would have agreed with the warning. Uh, and then I apologize for using Crystal Knock, as I just said before. And I had a pleasant discussion uh, with Abe Foxman just before I came here, and I, I hope that at least that part is put to rest. So more than 90 Jews were killed in Kristallnacht, 30,000 people put in concentration camps. Right. What were you going for? I, analogy. I, the, the Jews were only 1% of the German population. Most Germans had never met a Jew, and yet Hitler was able to demonize the Jews, and Kristallnacht was one of the earlier manifestations, but there had been others before it. And then, of course, we know about the evil of the Holocaust. I, I guess my point was that when you start to use hatred against a minority, it can get out of control. I think that was 
my thought. And now that as a messenger I've been thoroughly killed by everybody, at least read the message, you know? You mentioned the word hatred. Yes. Do you feel threatened? I don't feel personally threatened, uh, but I think that a very important part of America, namely the creative one percent, are threatened. I, I've, I'm friends with uh, Al Gore, uh, who tells me that uh, inequality is the number one problem in America. I'm friends with Jerry Brown. I voted for him. I will vote for him even though he raised my taxes 30 uh, percent. He tells me the number one problem in America is inequality. And that's probably and possibly true. And I think President Obama is going to make that point tomorrow night. But the one percent are not causing the inequality. They are the job creators. I mean, Silicon Valley is, I think Kleiner Perkins itself over the years is created pretty close to a million jobs, and we're still doing it. Uh, it it's absurd to <laughs> demonize the rich for being rich and for doing what the rich do, which is get richer by creating opportunity for others. How do you feel threatened? Oh, well, I said I didn't feel personally threatened. I feel, however, that as a class, I think we are beginning to engage in class warfare. I think the rich as a class are threatened through higher taxes, higher regulation, uh, and so forth. And so that is my message. If this is the kind of persecution that is happening to the 1%, yes. what's happening to the 99%? I think the 99%, I mean, I. I did not come originally from the one percent. I grew up as one of the 99 percenters. And so I'm your classical self-made man, if you will. Uh, I think the 99 percent is struggling and really struggling to get along in America. I mean, we have ever increasing regulation, higher costs, I think, caused by more government than we need. Uh, small business, it's difficult to form and prosper in a small business these days. It's difficult to hire. Uh, and that, that, in my view, is what is hurting and causing, the, hurting the 99% and causing the inequality. Uh, so I think that the solution is less interference, lower taxes, let the rich do what the rich do which is get richer, but along the way, they bring everybody else with them when the system is working. Now, you are a multimillionaire. No, I'm not a billionaire. I'm You're a multimillionaire. Not a billionaire. I said multimillionaire. I've created some billionaires, but I unfortunately am not one. You have owned fancy yachts, yes. fancy cars, yes. and underwater submersible airplane. Do underwater you, airplane. I, I, I saw it. It's basically an airplane that flies underwater. Right. Do you worry at all that you are divorced from reality? Are you divorced from reality? I, I don't know if anybody can answer that uh, <laughs> truthfully. I don't think so. I give and have given and will give millions and millions of dollars to a long list of charities. I have in mind some more uh, chairs at universities. Uh, to give. Uh, I still want to leave my children something that they can have, uh, even though upon my death the government will take about 45 percent. Um, so, yeah, I think I'm connected to reality. I, I've got lots and lots of friends uh, that are younger and uh, in this whole uh, uh, web-based, uh, uh, Twitter-based world, uh, and I think I know what they're thinking and talking about, yes. What about Silicon Valley? Is Silicon Valley, to a certain extent, divorced from reality? You have kids. You mentioned you created billionaires. You have kids making six-figure salaries, getting free perks at technology companies, taking shuttles, 
uh, with Wi-Fi access down to the peninsula, which regular residents don't have access to. Is there something to be said for this idea that Silicon Valley really is living in its own little bubble? Uh, yeah, I think there's something in that. Uh, on the other hand, it's a bubble that has created, that has changed the world, it has created incredible wealth, you know, around America and around the world. And maybe you have to put up with a little techno geek arrogance in order to um, get the results of those sort of folks thinking. Um, so, uh, <laughs> how do you see this divide playing out? Um, well, now that as a messenger I've been shot, I think at least read the message. <laughs> and, but you just said at the beginning of this that you, regr you regret the, the way this the, message the, was I conveyed. regret the use of that word. It was a terrible misjudgment. I don't regret the message at all. In fact, I... What is the message? The message is any time the majority starts to demonize a minority, no matter what it is, it's wrong and dangerous. And no good ever comes from it. What's the solution? First, to understand the problem, uh, be aware of it. That's why I wrote the letter. Uh, and I, I don't apologize for writing the letter. I should not have used that awful word. But the letter said what I believed. And I believe we have to be careful that we don't demonize uh, anybody and that we certainly don't demonize the most creative part of our society. Your venture capital firm, Kleiner Perkins, said in a statement that they were shocked by the words that you used and do not agree, and that you haven't been involved in the firm in many, many years. How do you respond to what they said? I mean, do you understand why there's been that kind of backlash? Yeah, I, uh, first of all, my letter was not about Kleiner Perkins. I didn't mention Kleiner Perkins uh, at all. Uh, they didn't need to say anything, but they chose, I guess, to sort of throw me under the bus. And um, I didn't like that. They, they said they were shocked. And I sort of feel like the guy saying, look, don't go swimming. There are sharks in that water. And if you get shocked by that, you, you don't understand the warning. I was presenting a warning, and I don't, I don't think they got that. And then secondly, they, they made a, quite a point of my not having been involved uh, for some years, and that's true. And I think as I've distanced myself from the firm, there's been a, a corresponding uh, decline in the firm, but I won't go further than that. Uh, in a way, I miss them. I hope they miss me. And we will bury the hatchet over this one. Your name is on the door. Yes. So when you say something, it does reflect on them to a certain extent. Or do you worry about it reflecting on them? I, uh, well, I didn't, I didn't have them in mind when I wrote this piece. And it wasn't about them. It had nothing to do with them. But they're right that their philosophies and strategies have diverged significantly from my own, and that my name on the door probably doesn't mean very much, if anything, anymore. Do you think your name should still be on the door? Some that's people say it shouldn't after this op-ed. <laughs> I think that's a real issue for them to decide. I don't care whether it comes or goes. When you said that there's been a decline in their performance, do you think if you had still been involved, it would be different? That was implied by what I said, but I'm not going to enlarge upon that. All right. Well, let's talk a little bit about the solution here. You mentioned your friend, Eugene Kleiner, right. late Eugene Kleiner, um, fled Austria, fled Hitler. Do you think he would have agreed with you? Oh, yes, I think he would have, because I, <laughs> I was not talking about the Nazis. I was talking about the persecution of a minority by the majority. And Kleiner always distrusted uh, those sorts of trends in American politics. Uh, 
n not in con like connection with Semitism or anti-Semitism, but just in general. And so I think he thoroughly would have understood my message and, and approved of it. And uh, oddly, I have had, you know, I've, there's been a lot of email, a lot of Twitter. Um, shortly before I came over here, I got an email from a, a, a person I, I don't know uh, from New England, and he said, Mr. Perkins, I'm just going to quote part of this. Sure. Mr. Perkins, I'm a Democrat and consider myself a liberal. I am bewildered by the amount of scapegoating that has been directed toward the American success stories. To blame, to lay blame for society's ills at the feet of the demographic group that is, that is irresponsible and dangerous. Please continue to speak out and use this platform you have found to speak against this type of irresponsible finger pointing from a liberal. <laughs> So um, you have conservatives out there, though, like yeah, Mark Andreessen calling you the leading well, he, a hole in the he, state. Yes, it wasn't a very nice word. And considering that he doesn't know me and I don't know him, uh, I don't think he's entitled to his opinion. If he knew me, perhaps. Uh, Paul Krugman called me uh, crazy in today's New York Times. Paul Krugman also pointed out that rising income inequality can have very negative economic that, financial consequences that, in the sense that if there is if it leaves us more economically vulnerable and you see I think the, the people who are rich can't pay for stuff then well, everyone suffers well just what you said is such a contradiction of intermixed ideas uh, he won the Nobel Prize uh, in economics I can't argue economics with him but uh, to demonize the job creators is crazy, and to demonize the rich who spend and buy things and, and stimulate the economy is crazy. Uh, I heard on the uh, uh, news hour with uh, oh um, oh gosh. Uh, Name it's, escapes. It's okay. Anyway, Tell us what New York heard. Times, and they got into a discussion about the idiocy of Rolex watches, and why does any man need a Rolex watch? And it's just a symbol of, of uh, terrible values, and et cetera, et cetera. Well, <laughs> I think that's a little silly. Uh, this isn't a Rolex. I could buy a six-pack of Rolexes for this, but so what? I want to talk to you about something else that came up in your letter, and that is. Danielle Steele, um, you sounded quite upset about some of uh, the way that the San Francisco Chronicle in particular ha has talked about her. I know she is your ex-wife. Is this personal for you? Yes, I think the inspiration for writing the letter came from the most recent attacks by the San Francisco Chronicle on Danielle Steele. Uh, it all started with complaints about the height of her hedge around her house and then got into that she writes uh, pot boilers and is a snob and so forth. And uh, Danielle and I are no longer married, but we're very close. I felt sorry for her. I felt she was being victimized. She is the number one author in the world, over a billion books in print. Finally outdid Agatha Christie. And she was awarded the French Legion of Honor for both literature and humanitarian activities. None of that was reported in the Chronicle. So I thought since I'm a knight, I'm a literal knight of the kingdom of Norway, I would get on my horse and charge forth in her defense. So we can see all the blood I've spilled in that process. Gio, you mentioned your watch, Tom, <laughs> and that it could buy a six pack of Rolexes. Oh, that's naughty. That was off the, off the air. <laughs> you mentioned before though, that you- It was a you... gift, however. It was a gift from the people. What's the brand of it? Uh, it's called a Richard Mille. All right. And it was a gift from the Perini company because I built this big boat. And you mentioned that them. you were from the 99%. You came from the 99%. I sure did. So this is something that you never in a million years expected that you would one day be able to wear. Absolutely. Tell me more about where you came from. Well, I, I am a nerd, uh, a geek. Um, I was, uh, went to White Plains High School. Uh, which in those days wasn't a particularly good high school, 
and it was very athletically oriented and I was not an athlete and then I got a scholarship to MIT where I became captain of the swimming team so I suddenly went from being a geek in a school of jocks to a jock in a school of nerds so <laughs> how quickly your life can change anyway I got a great education at MIT I went on to Harvard Business School and then I came to work for David Packard at Hewlett Packard which was a very small company back then this is in 1957 uh, I think the revenues were under 20 million a year and everything I learned about venture capital I learned from David Packard and we became very close friends uh, throughout his life and he was my mentor. So here we are, decades later. Yes. You've made millions, you've created billionaires, you've helped create billion dollar companies. Yes. What is the responsibility of those companies to the city of San Francisco, to the people who live in the city of San Francisco? I, I think we're talking about the leadership of the companies. I, I, I don't like the idea of companies uh, giving money to political campaigns, even though it's legal. I, I don't like that. But what about so, the policies that they create? Well, I'm not talking yeah. about CEOs giving right. millions of dollars away. I'm talking about the companies themselves. These are companies that offer free perks, right. for example, for their employees. Well, it's a competitive industry, and, and I don't know what they have to offer to get and keep the em employees, but obviously uh, free lunches uh, keep people working during the lunch hour and so forth. So it's not all just uh, love and honey buns. But someone like Mark Benioff at Salesforce says, look, I don't, I don't want to offer too many free things because I want my employees to spend their money on Market Street. Uh, I think that's a good sentiment. I I don't disagree with that, but I think the leadership of these companies uh, should be political and engaged in politics. Now, John Doerr, my partner, has been very political and deeply engaged with the Obama administration. He's been on various task forces and committees, and I think that's great. I think politics is very, very, very important. We can't ignore it, and we can't ignore the direction it's going. Now, obviously, I'm not a liberal, and I'm a conservative in a very liberal community. But nevertheless, I think that the CEOs of Silicon Valley should very much pay attention to where the liberal flag is leading currently. It's leading to, as I've said, demonizing the rich, blaming the lack of job creation on the rich, which is, in my opinion, simply preposterous. And you just, right or left or in the middle, you can't ignore the drift in national politics. Or if you do ignore it, it will be to your regret. But for the 99%, they can't ignore the rising housing prices. So let me give you some numbers. Housing prices are up 50% in the last five years in San Francisco. The city hasn't released the most recent data, but we know that only 269 new housing units were created in 2011. At the same time, from 2010 to 2012, 25,000 new people moved here. There just isn't enough room for everyone. Well, everybody wants to live in San Francisco, and I don't blame them. Uh, I, we're getting into an area that, I, honestly, my qualifications are very thin. But rent control and things like that have a lot to do with this. And using capitalism to create more housing is part of the solution. Uh, building the high rises is part of the solution. And the Google buses are part of the solution, I suppose. So, uh, but I, I, the, this is a, uh, I think the 99% across America should pay attention to politics, follow where it's going. Do read the newspapers. Don't try to get everything over Twitter and Facebook. It's not there. And worry about the future. Because right now, I think America faces a very, very troubled future. I feel that we, I sometimes feel at least, that we've gone past the point of no return. I hope I'm wrong. Do you at all feel their frustrations? 
though? Absolutely. Of course I do. I, I have members of my own family that are, you know, living in trailer parks. Uh, not my immediate family, but relatives. Uh, sure I do. Of course I do. What about the city of San Francisco? <laughs> well, I think it, it, I believe that it's always been overpriced and uh, expensive and after all it was not called Knob Hill for nothing. The Nababs lived there and the floods and the Huntingtons and so forth. So it has a long history of being wealthy and extravagant and uh, desirable and a little crazy. It's San Francisco. Is there an obligation? Does the city of San Francisco have, a, have an obligation to have a place for everyone? Should everyone be allowed to or able to live here? Um, Emily, the marketplace, if left alone, will take care of that. Rents go up, uh, houses get built. Just the city should stay out of the economics of capitalism, in my opinion. Now, you mentioned you give millions to charity. Yes. And why have, not, have for a long time. Why not use your money to, to, to create an organization to combat some of these issues rather than writing a letter to the editor? Well, first of all, uh, I am doing a bit of that, but um, I firmly believe in, in giving most of my money to medically, uh, medical institutions and institutions of higher education, cultural things like the San Francisco Ballet, which I basically ran for one year long ago. Uh, I've even done philanthropy in, in Norway. That's how I wound up being a Norwegian knight. So I've, and I've been doing this all my life. And when I look back, you know, those $1970 uh, that I was spreading around are now only worth five cents. So if we use that multiplier factor, I've given away one hell of a lot of money. You were called the king of Silicon Valley, I believe, at one point. How would you describe yourself? <laughs> oh, I certainly have enough arrogance to be royal. Uh, but I, I'm an old man. I uh, look back upon my career with great happiness. I think I've accomplished a lot. If I had to do it again, I don't know what I'd change. Um, and I'm at peace with myself. And uh, the fact that everybody now hates me is just part of the game. Uh, and I'm sorry about that, but that isn't what I meant to do. Tom Perkins, co-founder of Kleiner Perkins Coffee Buyers, thanks so much for joining us today here on Bloomberg West.